Welcome to Special Interviews. I'm your host, Eugene Perrier, and joining us here, we have Dr. Webster Tarpley. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tarpley. Thank you, a pleasure. Good to be with you. Dr. Tarpley is a historian, a journalist, and a prolific author, and also the host of his own radio show, World Crisis Radio, I believe. That's right. Excellent. Well, Dr. Tarpley, just over a month ago, you returned from Iran. You were traveling across uh, Iran. So I want to start there with the situation in Iran. We've seen an increase in sanctions, an increase in covert activity from the United States, just a general increase in belligerency. So so I'm wondering from you, what do you think is behind the Western uh, attacks on Iran and threats against Iran? Well, basically, we're, we're dealing, first of all, with the world economic depression, which grips especially the United States, North America, Europe, the British, although it has, it has effects everywhere. China is going into decline. India, Brazil, I think, are all at least slowing down. And within that, you have the State Department and the CIA attempting to uh, reorganize the empire uh, in order to permit a greater rate of looting and exploitation on the economies of the world to try to prop up uh, the London and New York banks. About one and a half quadrillion to two quadrillion dollars of uh, complex financial derivatives at the, at the heart of that bankruptcy. So the word went out sometime uh, you know, in the previous uh, year, and we're, we're talking now about uh, 2010, uh, to destabilize basically all the governments in the Middle East and, and far beyond that. Uh, and that's what we've had, a, a series of uh, color revolutions, CIA people power coups. It was announced really by WikiLeaks, which was a CIA limited hangout operation that targeted the leaders of the countries that were going to be destabilized, didn't create any problems for for uh, Washington or London or, or the Israelis, but just focused on the, on the countries that they wanted to hit. So uh, that is the thing that has been marching along now, uh, starting in Tunisia, right? Starting in Tunisia, it's been revealed in the meantime that the Bouazizi case was uh, essentially a fraud, that mm -hmm. this guy was not what he said he was. I had a chance in Tehran to talk to a distinguished uh, Tunisian movie maker who basically... And this is the individual who set himself on fire, correct? Yeah, yes. that he was, uh, this was somebody who was cheating people in the market. He was using a fake scale to, to rip people off, and the woman uh, inspector who got him to come to the police station was trying to inspect his scale, uh, and that uh, the Bouazizi was not a hero of a revolution, but he was then, he was made into one by the, by the Western media. But the basic idea is, in, in Tunisia, all of the generals had been subverted in advance by the French, by the British, the CIA, so that when Ben, ben Ali turned to them and said, look, I got these street demonstrations going, uh, will you support me? The general said no, and that was the critical moment. In Egypt, it was the overthrow of uh, Mubarak. This was demanded directly by the Obama White House, Samantha Power, and Michael McFowl, who's not now gone on to Moscow, were on the phone with uh, Field Marshal Tantawi and General Enan saying, get rid of Mubarak, get him out of there, we want, uh, we want to destabilize the country. By the time they got to Gaddafi, things had slowed down a little bit, and Gaddafi put up much more of a fight than the U.S. and the British uh, expected. At this point, they had to drop the mask, and all the rhetoric about freedom, democracy, human rights was replaced by the brutal reality of NATO bombing, foreign mercenaries, uh, this colonial model of having European officers commanding uh, terrorist uh, troops from you know, every conflict zone uh, in, in half of the world. So unfortunately, though, Libya was isolated. It didn't have enough international support and therefore was was crushed. Now, by the time we get to Syria, and I will get to Iran in a minute, but <laughs> with Syria, it's different. And what has also happened in the meantime is that instead of having the weak appeaser Medvedev, somebody who was interested in uh, hamburger diplomacy with, with Obama, he went to Silicon Valley and fawned on Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all this stuff. Um, now you have Putin back. And that, of course, I think is, is, is what is preventing a, a general war in the Middle East right now, because the, the, the rebellion in Syria from the very beginning was much weaker than any of the, of the ones so far, especially much weaker than Libya from the military point of view. They were, these rebels are really NATO death squads that were able to take over selected neighborhoods of, of peripheral cities, border cities, places like Dera or Idlib or Homs or Hama or Banias for, for a little while. 
but they were never able to get into the big places, Aleppo, Damascus, and they, they didn't have that much support. My estimate in, in Syria was that uh, Assad had about 65 percent support. I think about two-thirds is a good, a good rule of thumb. So that has now been, been brought to a, uh, a halt. Now, the, the benefit of Iran is that Iran had already shown in the summer of 2009 that a color revolution could be stopped, that you didn't have to just uh, let, let the CIA... And this is the Green Movement you're speaking of. Yeah, the Green Movement. Now, the Green Movement started from an election. And the idea was you had uh, Ahmadinejad, and then you had uh, Mousavi and one or two other candidates. Uh, Mousavi represented, in many ways, the worst of, of things that had gone on in Iran in the, in the 1980s. In mm. other words, he was, he was part of a lot of uh, dubious policy choices. The idea was, though, that you had to allege that the, the vote was somehow unfair. And the wealthy people of Tehran North had this idea, well, we're all for Mousavi. Mousavi must be the winner. But of course, no. You have to look at the whole country. And I think there's a possibility Mousavi may well have won uh, Tehran, but I don't know how, by how much. But when you look at the, the vote totals from the entire country, there's no doubt. Ahmadinejad was the winner of this election, fair and square, and, and therefore the legitimate president of, uh, of Iran. And I think he has a lot of, um, a lot of good features. Uh, one thing I would point to, just in terms of internal economics, you don't hear a lot about it, the idea of building 22 million housing units over a period of years, compare that to Obama. With Obama, we've had 8 million people, 8 million families thrown out of their homes through foreclosures. So well, that's interesting. I want to touch on that because you mentioned the economic crisis. And certainly we know that uh, the Wall Street interests, uh, you know, who were bailed out have a significant uh, impact or, or influence on the Obama administration. Do you feel that the differences between the United States and Iran are somehow based on the fact that Iran as a nation doesn't want to follow the, the Bretton Woods, Wall Street type interests, which want most non-Western countries traditionally to be weak? Well, uh, Bretton Woods, of course, we haven't had Bretton Woods for 40 years. Certainly, I certainly. Well, I mean the World Bank and the IMF. Bretton, Bretton Woods worked okay as long as you had the entire system. It was actually the best system that we'd ever had before or since. But now we're left with the bad side, you might say, which, and the bad side has been made even worse. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are, of course, the center of what we have to call imperialism. This is the main uh, threat. It prevents uh, world economic development, and it really is the, the root cause of many, many, many evils. Now, uh, the model that you have with Ahmadinejad is a populist uh, economic one, which, again, I think ha has much to, uh, to recommend it. And you, c you can see this also in these other countries. Uh, in Libya, you had a country that had gone up to number 57 on the uh, human rights, the human uh, development index of the United Nations. In Syria, there's a strong social safety net in the sense of a, of a highly subsidized bread price and uh, a lot of other things that really help the, the, the poorer people. In, in Iran, President Ahmadinejad has taken this initiative of transforming the uh, subsidies into direct cash payments, mm -hmm. right? So instead of having a subsidized bread price, fuel price, and other things, you get simply a, a, a sum of money given to you by the, by the government. Now so that, sort of like a guaranteed minimum income. Well, it's not quite that much, but it's in, instead, in other words, in lieu of the subsidy that you'd be enjoying, that everybody would mm -hmm. be, you get this cash payment. The idea is to try to avoid certain distortions, because of course, it, we would, don't, don't need to go into it, but this was the, the path chosen. The, the thing is that the, for the average person in Iran, for the average worker or farmer, the, the uh, payment in lieu of the subsidy is, is a, good, uh, a good, good amount. But if you're one of the wealthy people from Tehran North, then you say, no, it's not enough. So this is, once again, this, this class division. And I believe that the class division actually... Uh, counts much more than, uh, than than many others might say. Certainly. And one thing I want to, as someone who has traveled in Libya, I want to go back to a bit because we've mentioned, uh, you mentioned the various factions that are at play. One thing we've seen playing out over the past several weeks is an increase in regional faction, uh, factionalism, a growth of lawlessness. Do you think that this was the strategy that U.S. imperialism and Western imperialism 
they were hoping for this outcome, or this is almost an unintended consequence of the NATO intervention? No, the, it's a deliberate consequence. I mean, you can look in the writings of Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example, uh, where he says that the future belongs to microstates and mini-states. And we, the British are now carrying this experiment out on their own body, right? Mm -hmm. It's very likely that Scotland will become autonomous in some form, although it really won't have sovereignty because it'll be under the Bank of England and the, uh, and the International Monetary Fund. So it's going to be a very, very hollow form of independence. But the idea is when you're confronting a country like Libya, if it's one country, that's one thing. If it's three different countries, if it's Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, Fezzan, and sort of uh, you know, desert emirates or whatever, then it's much easier to deal with. So the goal of this policy is not the human rights or the dignity of any of the, of the populations, which is what Brzezinski claims, but it's simply to make sure that these are petty, impotent entities that could not stand up to ExxonMobil, J.P. Morgan Chase, Blackwater, Halliburton, or these multinational corporations. And that you can see the way they did it in Libya. The, the rebellion was, was prepared from the Cyrenaica area, the French had gone in and subverted a key general by the name of Mesmari, and he brought some other generals with him. You had a, a history of anti-Gaddafi sentiment in that area. It goes back to the resentment of monarchists, because that's where the king used to be located, right? King Idris of, of Libya and the Senussi Brotherhood ran that Cyrenaica area. Uh, this also by the, in, an area by the Egyptian border where the British had had their networks uh, implanted. So uh, it was a little bit easier to, to do it on a geographical basis. But without the, uh, the, the NATO bombing, that would never have worked. In other words, the civil war would have ended and Gaddafi would have re reunited the country. In the process of, of overthrowing Gaddafi, they brought in notorious al-Qaeda terrorists, like uh, this guy Belhaj, right, also known as Hasidi, Hasadi. Uh, He's now gone on to, to Syria. He's now accused by the Russian uh, foreign ministry of, of, of being in, in Syria and, and carrying out terror activities. And I, I think it's, it's, it's quite true. So uh, he was brought in, and uh, what you've got now is essentially warlords. You've got chaos. And I think people in Syria look at Libya and they say, oh my gosh, if we go for these empty slogans of freedom, democracy, and human rights, the reality behind that is the chaos that you have in, in Libya. There's, the central government has very little authority, and local warlords seem to be emerging. From the U.S.-British point of view, that's fine, because all you need is the warlord who controls the oil well and the pipeline to the tanker terminal, and you don't care about the rest. And do you think that the recent discussions uh, here in Washington about the United States potentially arming the Free Syrian Army are aimed in a similar direction? Yeah, they've been doing that from the very beginning. That's all there ever was. See, it's, a, it's an empty discussion. It's, it's bluffing, and, and, and I, the Syrian uh, government knows it. We're, we're now about one year into the rebellion, right? It started around March 15th right. of, uh, of, of 2011. So one year of this stuff, what does it show us, right? Based on, on, on actual research that I've done on the ground in the Zara neighborhood of Homs, in an area called Banyas, a little bit north of Tartus, where the famous Russian naval base is located, what happened in Syria was that death squads, uh, what the CIA calls the Salvadoran model, these death squads, which had been prepared during the course of the Iraqi war, for use against Syria, because they regarded Syria as part of the, of the logistical backup for the, for the resistance against the U.S. In, in Iraq. Those death squads were ready to go. A lot of them were foreign fighters. A lot of them were al-Qaeda. Um, and they were brought in with the help of people like Saad Hariri of Lebanon, of the Turks, I'm afraid, went very far down this road. Jordan, they worked very closely with the Israelis. and. Uh, and, and then Iraq, right? And, and the, the Iraqi part is the, is the Iraqi Kurdistan part. So with that, they were able to get these, these, these death squads going. And they started killing people. And that's what I found in, in, uh, in Homs, that people were, were basically saying, our, ba our problem here is that there are snipers on the roofs of these houses. And they're killing civilians. And they're killing any civilians because they know as soon as somebody's dead, Al Jazeera will arrive and say, aha, another victim of the Assad regime. And you can see this. This approach is, is embodied in the United Nations uh, uh, documents on this. They assume anybody killed in, in Syria 
is killed by the regime, even though they also admit that, that the, the, uh, the rebellion was armed and violent from the very beginning. Uh, the, the actual political component of it, I think, is, is minimal. In other words, the people who supported an armed rebellion against the Assad government in Syria were very, very few. There's a larger group that wanted reform. Uh, they were interested in a dialogue, but not in, uh, in starting a, a, a civil war. It never got, I don't think it ever will get to the, to the point of a civil war. What you really got right now is the Syrian army proceeding against these small neighborhood size enclaves, which are held by uh, foreign fighters with the help of deserters, draft dodgers, criminal elements, uh, disgruntled elements. And do you think elements. that, uh, well, I don't know if Trojan horse is the right word, but perhaps destabilization of Syria in the minds of, you know, whether it's the White House or, you know, uh, over in London, could be potentially the first domino leading towards uh, further destabilization of Iran? Yes, absolutely, because they're, they're basically two considerations, right? One is that Syria appears as the principal Arab ally of Iran, and that's a, it's a kind of a strategic uh, combine. Uh, if you add in the Shiite areas, the sort of the lower Euphrates in Iraq, it becomes a more or less a continuous block of territory. So that's one thing. And the other side is Hezbollah. Hezbollah uh, is, a, is a, uh, something that gives the Israelis uh, all kinds of uh, problems in the sense that they tried to invade Lebanon and they were defeated. Hezbollah defeated them. So that what they're trying to do in, in destabilizing Syria is to deprive Hezbollah of their strategic uh, hinterland and their logistics. Right? Where do you get your logistical backup if you're Hezbollah? It comes in, comes in largely through Syria. So. This is a complete cynical neo-colonialist, neo-imperialist operation. It has nothing to do with human rights or anything of the sort. Indeed, uh, you can see it. Where the Syrian National Council now loudly demands NATO bombing and a civil war. Wonderful. In, uh, in Libya, it was about 150,000 killed. If we do the, the population uh, relations between Libya and Syria, in Syria, that means well over half a million dead and, uh, and a civil war that would go on much longer. Now, you mentioned briefly earlier the change in leadership in Russia. And I wonder if you see the new Putin administration, and we've seen that whether it's in the United Nations or just generally in front of the Arab League, the Russian government has seemed to have been taking a very, a very strident anti-interventionist line in Syria. Is this something that you see as perhaps a, a limited phenomenon or maybe a new assertive stance by the Russian government? Well, strident, I, wouldn't, I don't know about <laughs> strident. Right? I think this is simply based on international law. It's based on the UN Charter. Right? UN Charter says interfering in the internal affairs of sovereign states is strictly forbidden. And, and, and all of the you know, sort of novelties that have been smuggled in by people like Samantha Power, uh, and others, right, or Kushner with humanitarian intervention. This is a lot of, a lot of baloney, we would say. Um, rather, uh, it, it's, it's Im important to see that uh, Putin is back. And I think Putin, the return of Putin in my book is on the same level as Franklin D. Roosevelt winning the 1940 election to get a third term, which means that, meant that the U.S. was going to oppose Hitler and not not appease him, or when de Gaulle came back to, to Paris in 1958. I think it's a, it's a turning point of that uh, magnitude. The U.S. and the British hate and fear Putin. They are apoplectic. They're beside themselves. You can see a kind of muted uh, version of this response in the in the media, but th their dismay is, is tremendous. And is that good for the region, do you think, to have Russia playing this new Absolutely, because role? what we've had is we've had 20, 20 plus years of m unipolar US, British, Israeli, NATO domination of the area. And what has that led to, right? We've had wars in Iraq. Uh, we've had, all, we've had uh, all of these wars, Afghanistan, the out of area. but. Also contiguous, uh, the Israelis uh, attacking Lebanon, attacking Gaza constantly, basically continuously. So what, what you're looking for is a counterpole. In other words, the, the, the unipolar world has brought out the absolute worst tendencies of the U.S. ruling class and of U.S. society in general. What we need is some kind of a counterweight to contain and, and uh, dissuade those uh, very bad imperialist tendencies. But now, for Putin, 
he's got to do something. It's not, it's not enough just to vote no in the United Nations, although it's wonderful that they did vote no. You've got to do something more, because if you, if you don't uh, have some kind of an active component in your policy, then eventually the U.S. and the British will find some way to manufacture an incident, some false flag event or something, something like this. So therefore, I, I, the one idea is uh, why not call a general Middle East peace conference? Uh, Netanyahu will be uh, against it, of course, because he says there should be no negotiations with Iran. That's obviously absurd. Why not promote a general Middle East peace conference if the Israelis feel threatened and let them come to a conference and explain why? And if, if Iran feels that uh, it has the right to have a full nuclear fuel cycle, then let them come and explain it. Uh, we've also got Iraq has been devastated by war, needs to be rebuilt. Lebanon has been devastated by war, needs to be rebuilt. Libya is now in the same category, and Syria ha has undergone a certain amount of uh, wear and tear as well. So there are all kinds of real, real uh, issues. And then you have other problems which get very little attention, like what about water? You look at a place like Yemen, right? There's a big political struggle in Yemen. Uh, the underlying reality of Yemen is that within a few years, there's going to be huge water shortage on the way to having no water. In other words, basically zero water for an entire country. What are we going to do about that? Isn't that the real issue that underlies many, many of these uh, political phenomena? And do you think that the, the new role of Russia, or potentially there being more space, offers any sort of chance for greater let me say, comity between nations, peace in the Middle East, uh, will, it, uh, will, will having less of a U.S. or perhaps the Western influence blunted to an extent provide an opening towards resolving some of these conflicts without, uh, you know, the external actors? I, I think you're going to have to have a, a, a kind of a showdown with the U.S. ruling elite, because I think the U.S. ruling elite has, they have strong symptoms of psychosis uh, as a social class. Uh, what I see is a war psychosis under Bush Cheney that has remained in certain key circles, but now you've got the destabilization psychosis with Obama, right? That he thought he could remake the world, not using military means so much, although those were there, but the color revolutions, the CIA people power coups. Now, I think with the defeat of Syria, the march of the color revolutions across the world has been stopped, and by defeat I mean the, 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 the destabilization of Syria has been stopped. But you've also got this depression going on in the background. In other words, one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton and Obama are so crazy is that these people are Wall Street puppets. They, they take their orders ultimately from this point where the Wall Street group intersects the State Department, the CIA, and the, and the permanent uh, institutions of the invisible government that we have here. Uh, and they're not going to, their idea is that they've got to ride this color revolution wave all the way to Tehran, all the way to Beijing, all the way to Moscow. And the fact that it's not working is there's going to be a psychological crisis for them somewhere along the way. The other thing I would say is we need an effective internal opposition. Mm -hmm. This Occupy Wall Street has gotten about 5 or 10 percent of what they could have gotten if they'd had a political approach instead of a silly anarchist approach. Uh, well, in that perspective, then, given that we've seen the Washington Post-ABC poll that came out earlier this week that 60 percent of people were opposed to the war in Afghanistan, including 50 percent of Republicans, does that make you more hopeful that people in the United States who have you know, seen so many wars and seen this over and over again will be able to uh, offer an effective opposition? Yes, except that the peace movement that we had under Bush Cheney is essentially gone. It's basically disappeared. Obama sucked all the oxygen out of their room. The foundations that used to fund those peace demonstrations are all for Obama. They've mm -hmm. cut off their, their funding. What you need is instead of having a bunch of hippies saying, we get to camp in the park and we're going to have a hippie commune in Zuccotti Park, a political mass strike movement that has demands like, let's have a Wall Street sales tax. Let's actually tax Goldman Sachs, right? We're hearing new nefarious things about them every day. Let's stop foreclosures, not just protest them, but stop them with a the federal law. We had the Fraser-Lemke Act back in the 1930s. How about Medicare for all? Anybody who wants it for $100 a month or some token uh, fee, if, you, if you're destitute, then you, you get it for free. In other words, concrete measures, not the idea we're going to have a commune 
in, in the park and we're going to pretend that we've started a new civilization. That was tried last autumn. It's a failure. And when the police came to shut them down, since these protesters hadn't really fought for anybody else in the society except themselves, nobody was willing to fight for them. So, And so your analysis essentially is that what the American people need to do to develop a particular opposition is not necessarily run candidates or be involved in the political process in that way, but have a mass movement in the streets. Yeah, there's a mass movement which is to kick out the, the fascist governor of uh, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Walker, to uh, fight the fascist governor of Michigan, Snyder, who is trying to impose a dictatorship on the city of Detroit. Uh, the fascist governor of Ohio, Kasich, was fought to a standstill. He lost a referendum on his union-busting law. Unfortunately, in Indiana, the union-busting law has gone through. So that's a, a real theater of mass struggle. But then you've also got these, these other areas. The danger, of course, is that unless you have hard-hitting class-based demands, the Occupy movement becomes the left wing of the Obama campaign. And that's what a lot of these foundation-funded operatives who have been running uh, Occupy Wall Street or the, the, the main, the dominant forces, people around David Graeber, the anarchist uh, anthropologist, or the Adbusters Foundation of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Those are the people who say, kids, keep it generic, keep it vague, no demands, let's go have fun in the park. And eventually, that gets old, and they're swept away. So finally, and we just have a few seconds left here, just to, to sum up what you're saying, that Obama is certainly no answer, the Democrats are certainly no answer, and no effective opposition to the war drive on Iran and other nations in the Middle East. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid the, the political landscape in the United States is as bad as it could be, because you have the Republicans, I don't know, some of them are reactionaries, some of them are fascists. You look at Rick Santorum, he looks pretty much like Francisco Franco of Spain or Marshal Pétain of France. Some people would say clerical fascist. So those are either reactionaries or, or fascists. And then you look at Obama, and he's a Wall Street puppet. So that doesn't look very good. Now, there, there may be third parties that emerge. Uh, let me also That's add, right. Ron Paul is a sellout completely. Ron Paul has pledged to give his delegates to Romney, and it's a dirty deal to get some post like vice president or secretary of the treasury for his son Rand Paul who is actually much more of a warmonger than uh, yeah. than well, people might suspect. And there you have it. There's certainly a rogues gallery of individuals. So in the streets. Dr. Webster Tarpley, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, hopefully you'll join us again on special interviews. I'm your host Eugene Perrier. Thank you.